So let's talk about how the consciousness and the spirit body itself link in to this biological body. How does it work? Nobody knows. Nobody's talking about it. Well, almost. It's, it's crucial. This is, this is the way forward for us to understand more about who we are, why we're here, how to develop ourselves, how to be healthy, how to get healthy, how to restore health. This is a central question and it all ties in together. So there's clues. Let's look at some of the clues. For example, where is consciousness? Well, let's look at the opposite. To answer a question that's unanswered or unanswerable in the past, one of the things that I do is I look at a modification of the question. What's the opposite of that question? Like, let's look at what happens when there isn't consciousness. You know, uh, if, 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 uh, if a person's in a coma, what's happening? We're just learning that there's ac actually more consciousness than we thought during a coma in, in many cases. Uh, they're beginning to be able to observe activity in, in, the, in the cortex, in the brain, in some people who are in a coma. So they know, oh, gee, not everybody is like totally gone. They may be having some, uh, some perception. And uh, <clears throat> so oftentimes we'll, we'll think we have the answer because we come up with an idea, a model, but until we really have the evidence, like the, 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 the truth is, that no theory, no model, can ever be proven. You can disprove it, you can say, oh, it, it doesn't work, but the best we can ever say is that it works. So the clinical theory of everything is working, we can't say it's proven, and we can always make it better by finding the areas where, new questions that it can answer, that we haven't asked before. So always inviting more questions and looking for the, the big unanswered questions of science. Uh, so, if we look at consciousness, uh, if we look at loss of consciousness, one of the big clues that's really been well-researched, because it's kind of hard to study, we're just, like I say, just beginning to get information about loss of consciousness, say, in a person in a coma. But we have relatively little information about, for example, out-of-body and near-death experiences. We do have enough data points there, though, to, to rule out the conventional model of consciousness that says that it's an epiphenomena of the cortex. Because we know that when the, the brain is flatlined after a, a person having a heart attack, who later will recover from that, have the heart started, and tell us what their experiences were, we know that they have actually veridical, true experience during the time that their brain was flatlined. So consciousness doesn't happen in the brain per se. Yes, when you're in your body, it's happening in your brain, but not the brain alone. And so uh, when these people come back into their body, the experiences they have aren't from the perspective of the brain, the head, the eyes, the physical, biological body. They're from the perspective of up in the corner of the room. So the spirit, the conscious, the body that, that's perceiving, the, the immortal spirit, it has the holds the consciousness. When that spirit is in the physical body, then the consciousness is also coinciding with what's going on in the brain and the biological system. So, but let's take a look at, at surgery, at anesthesia. There's a huge clue, because now we have a whole range of physical, chemical substances that have been developed to specifically stop consciousness to put us into unconsciousness for the purpose of surgery. So there's no experience, no pain, etc. And so we can look at those compounds and we can see where their site of action is in the body. It's a huge clue, as I say. So the, the, all the, the, the data there shows that these uh, general anesthetics, the stronger they act, the more that they block consciousness, the stronger they concentrate in one particular place, and that's in the fat-soluble parts of the body, in the cell membrane. So the cell membrane appears to be the location of consciousness, not necessarily of, of 
of, you know, of information processing, of all the information processing, there's the subconscious and the unconscious, you know, cellular level consciousness. Uh, I look at consciousness as a fractal function, but so we're looking at the, the membrane of a cellular structure, whether that's an organism, like the body, we see that we have our senses concentrated on the surface, on the skin. We have sense of touch and temperature, pressure. We have some interior senses, kinesthetic positioning and motion and pressure, but that's relatively small compared to the surface. Just like on the cell, on the membrane, we have the cell membrane that, as we say, when it's disrupted by, by anesthetics, that's when the consciousness is not working. And we can look at actually what is the effect. These are substances that are generally loaded with chlorine and or fluoride uh, residues. These are very toxic halogen atoms. And what they do on, on, on an energetic level is when they're present, we can measure that it totally disrupts the coherence of that membrane. So coherence has a strong relationship with consciousness and a state of incoherence <laughs> means less consciousness you, you know kind of makes sense even in our language a person's inco incoherent it's like you know there, there's not much consciousness happening in that communication right or in their perception uh, so so the cell membrane is disrupted it becomes less coherent in its structure it means less like a, an organized a uh, fractal crystalline matrix and more like just a nasty gnarly soup of junk floating around in itself. Uh, so what also happens to the cell membrane in anesthesia is there's a disruption of the connection between the cell membrane and the interior and exterior of the cell. Those connections are formed by microtubules which are hollow tubes made of protein that contain water on the inside. That's a very interesting structure. Uh, it's, it's, there's there's a, a sanctuary of, of water on the inside, and so an energetic state in, in a, uh, like an antenna, a, a linear structure, like a wire, uh, that's isolated and separated somewhat from the environment around it. Not completely, it's connected at the ends, it's an open end, uh, and there's evidence that the, the conductivity of the water in that tube is increased something like 10,000% in the presence of what we call the spirit minerals, the ormus minerals, the minerals of, of alchemy, of consciousness, like the, uh, what's called the, the philosopher's stone of alchemy, that is consciousness embodied in a non-biological form, in, in, a, in a, a material mineral form. And these are, these Minerals are the minerals of the transition metals, we call them typically in chemistry, but in a non-metallic state. They're actually patented, uh, 1990s patent was awarded worldwide. Uh, the US patent was, it was acknowledged to be patent worthy, but that the government already had the information and was obviously uh, using it for operations that they won't describe, the secret black operations. Uh, things like space travel and mind control and who knows what, but all those kind of things. So they, there's already knowledge, secret knowledge of that, uh, but the public knowledge was patentable. And, and to get that patent, what David Hudson had to prove was that he could take the metallic states of, for example, iridium and rhodium, which we now know from the Russian uh, technology that's patented to be able to measure these uh, other states of, of states of matter in these minerals, is that in the brain tissue, 5% of the dry weight of the brain is, is rhodium and iridium in the M state, monatomic state, uh, orm state or ormus state, depending on who's writing about it, that I call the spirit minerals. Uh, that, that in science, uh, you know, in, in hard science, the, what you want to look at in relation to this is uh, a condensate or a Bose-Einstein condensate. There's various forms of condensates. Uh, and it's present in the environment as a, as a gaseous cloud that, ha that, that responds 
uh, in a tidal fashion with the, the with the uh, changes in the moon, just like the, the ocean tides, there's a tide in the Ormonds. And this, putting this in our model, helps us to explain you know, many observations through the ages that, that otherwise we, in modern science, tend to reject and say, I have no causal model for how that could be, therefore it can't be, therefore I can't see it. Like every, every culture has its term for energy and in the sense of spiritual, biological, conscious, it has all those ramifications. It's energy, chi in, in, in oriental medicine. You know, in, in some cultures there's multiple terms, like in oriental medicine there's also jing. You know, what's the difference between jing and chi? Uh, is chi prana? Is, you know, it's like when we have language, we put a name on some set of perceptions set of observations. There's the distinction between what is and what we call it. You know, and if, like in modern science, when we start naming things and, and then we start, we believe that we have named everything. I've named everything, that's all there is. If there's something else, I can't see it. You know, like the, the Native Americans in South America couldn't see the ships when they came from Europe because they had never seen it. They had no concept of something some vessel arriving there. It's like if we see a spaceship from, you know, another galaxy, we might not see it. We don't have a concept of it. So what, you know, it, that whole idea in quantum physics that, that the, the actual quantization doesn't happen until there's actually an observer. Which comes first? It's like a chicken and egg question. Which comes first, the observation or the concept? How, how you know, what's the beginning point of, of identification? You know, if a, a baby is born and sees patterns of light, at what point is there meaning? How is that meaning generated? Where does it come from? And, and does it precede the concept of, of language or a word? Is there a concept? Like a word is a phonon, it's a, it's a, it's a sound pattern. Uh, most of our other senses, besides hearing and, and pressure and touch, are more like sound, but uh, others are more like electromagnetism, like light. Like if we feel heat. We, we know, for example, that when we feel heat from the sun, we're not just feeling the, what we call heat in, in a physics sense. We can measure the heat. Oh, no, we're feeling more than the heat. And then if we take away the light, oh, yeah, that's part of the heat. We feel light as heat on the skin. So what is heat? Well, is light, is visible light, it's one octave, and, and heat we think of as infrared, that's another octave, but which language are we speaking? The language of the skin says that both of those octaves contain heat. We just learned that, that we can see with the eyes infrared photons. That there's conditions when we see the green flash in Kona, when the sun goes down, it was just finally you know, discovered why we see that and why we wouldn't see it with a camera. Camera never picks it up. Nope, it's the retina. The retina, if you have a single cell in the retina that perceives, it's a green cone that perceives green light at 550 nanometers, if there happen to be two photons of, 100, of, a thousand, of 1100 nanometers, just double that wavelength, which means it's half the energy, if you have two of those in that, stimulating that, cone cell at the same time, it gives you the same quantum energy as one green photon. So the cell has the same energetic response. Two for one sale. We're seeing green today. Okay, green. We see, we see it out there. We project it. We're actually having an effect out there too at the same time. It's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a loop here. There's a, there's a greater symmetry in what is than what we have heretofore imagined. I'll give you another example. In, in, in conventional science, we have the idea of, of heat being a, sort of a, a sink, a dissipation of energy into a low energy form that can't come back to a high energy form. But in fact, biological systems are the opposite. Biological systems increase coherence, increase, put energy into a coherent form. We know that 
that the energy in one human soul, based on the one study that we have from Dr. McDougall almost 100 years ago, is like 21 grams, plus or minus a big, big range. But if we take, you know, a, a typical amount that was found to be released at death, not accounted for by any physical, chemical, evaporation, any kind of other mechanism, and then has a specific, has an instantaneous effect and a, and a, and a time course waveform effect. So it has a quantum and a wave, a wave effect, just like other forms of existence on a quantum level. But this is on a, it's a quantum effect on a macroscopic biological level. So the amount of energy released or, or contained in one spirit, one human spirit, is is order is several uh, several times more energy than was released from matter into energy at Hiroshima with one bomb. Huge amount of energy. You 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 are not even just in your biological body, but in your immortal spirit and mind, you have that much power, that much energy. And by design, we are self-regulating. That's what all the bio biology is, is a whole series of what we call negative feedback loops, which means self-regulating. A negative feedback loop is where if something pushes the system this way, the system responds to, to correct itself, to balance itself, to maintain coherence, to maintain a certain balance. So this biological cell of life is an incredible generator of coherence. Right? I think billions of people added together. That's an incredible amount of energy that's not going in, sinking into, uh, uh, you know, irreplaceable, you know, irretrievable loss into heat energy. No, it's balancing that that increase in entropy they call it, or which another another modern view of entropy, of 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 heat, you know, of of dissipation of of energy concentration into an unusable form, is also an increase in information. So there's the universe is experiencing. We are the universe experiencing. Increasing the amount of knowledge and information, increasing the consciousness. It's another view, another interpretation of the, the expanding universe theory. If, if, that, if that fundamental model of, of uh, the Big Bang and expanding universe that the modern conventional science comes to, which isn't the only interpretation or only model by any means, it may not be the best one, but even within that model, if we look at it and say, well, Okay, from that perspective, we only see and understand a couple percent of what all is going on. We can see that there's much more. What is that? Spirit and consciousness makes up the vast majority of what is. And it's the consciousness, the dark energy factor, that's the expansive part. The information increases, the knowledge increases. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of the models of the black hole concept, which is a concept, not something that anybody's ever uh, observed directly. It's just a model. But one view is that, that that surface of the black hole where nothing can escape uh, is that it holds the information. That it's like if that was a surface of, of a divine conscious brain, that it would have knowledge of, of the space around it and the time around it. But, you know, as time passes, it's, it's gaining information, it's increasing in, in consciousness. So there's nothing that's lost. It's, we see in our environment, uh, you know, an increase in entropy, but what we don't measure is dark matter and dark energy. And according to our measures of those indirect measures, the dark energy is increasing. So, so there's our balance, our counterbalance for the increase, the increase in entropy in classical physics is oh, an increase in consciousness and coherence. Question? Is this, are you speaking about kind of the macro of what you were saying about the cell level as far as it relates to consciousness and um, you know, the uh, and 
anesthesia effects on consciousness? Yeah, the, 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 thank you. The, you can look at it at a micro-macro level, that's, that's the fractal view. That, that Fractal means the same mathematics applies to you and I as it does to neighboring cells in your liver or to, to atoms in a molecule or to two stars in a galaxy or to galactic clusters in, in, in the largest structures that we can see in space. That the, the mathematical relationship is, is, is one, is identity. It's the same material substance, the same process, same laws of electromagnetism, identical at all, all those scales. The, the, func the, the forms and shapes that plasma takes, that, that electromagnetic energy uh, forms in the body and in the cosmos is the same. Uh, so, so at a cellular level, the consciousness is at the cell membrane, at, at the level of uh, the mitochondria inside the cell. Well, that's a cell that's a, 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 like a bacterial cell, and it has a membrane, and so the, its consciousness is in its membrane. The, the nucleus of the cell has a membrane. Uh, other, other organelles have membrane functions. So we can look to those membranes as being like a holographic a uh, holographic collection of information of the interference patterns of waveforms as they hit that surface give that surface a simultaneous awareness of the three-dimensionality of the environment of the space around it. It's the film. And again, consciousness is the coherence of information between one space of space-time and another space-time. See, I think, I think it's, in my model, in my view, it's where Einstein was right about, re the only place that he was right about relativity is in the spirit, the mind and spirit side of the equation. It's, relativity is all about perception. It's about measurement. It's a thought, started with thought experiment about measurement and observation. That's about, that's asking, not about the physical body of the stars and planets or, or the biology, but about the perception, about the consciousness, about you know, weights and measures. How do we observe that? How does the clock change? How does it observe? How do we observe it? How do we measure things? You were going to ask. You were talking a little bit about the, uh, the, monoto the uh, monatomic minerals and something about them with the coherence of the cell membrane. Yeah, well, the, the, the membrane, we, we saw with the anesthetics that they're fat-soluble. The stronger their fat solubility, the stronger their partition coefficient in the fat-soluble phase, the stronger, more powerful they are as an anesthetic. Um, so with the relationship with the minerals of consciousness, the spirit minerals, the M-state minerals, the ormus, the philosopher's stone, is that it's oily. It has an affinity for oil. It's also sweet. It has an affinity for sugar, sugar has ring structures. Ring structures act as a, a mini Faraday cage or a sanctuary. The oil of the membrane does not conduct electricity. It's an insulator. It's a mini Faraday cage. It's, a, it's an insulator. It's, it's a sanctuary. So it's a, it's a place that, that these uh, consciousness minerals will tend to concentrate. Why are we programmed biologically on a chemical level, ignoring for a moment the, the spirit side, just on a biological level, why do we eat sugar? Because in a natural environment, sugar is present when fruit is ripe, which means it's full of nutrition and full of, of spiritual energy, it's ready, has all, everything it needs to make new life. And so we take that in, we get the B vitamins, we get everything we need to process the sugars, we get the spirit minerals because they sit in the ring structures of the sugars. But when, what happens when we refine things, we're using 50 and 60 hertz electromagnetic fields which drive the spirit away. We use metallic surfaces and blades and, you know, like in Lord of the Rings, they're cutting and biting <laughs> and taking the spirit out of it, destroying, separating it what I call weaponizing. This sh r white sugar, refined sugar, and uh, most other things that are refined are weaponized. They've had their spirit removed from them, so if they were a spirit, a carrier of spirit minerals, like a sugar, well now it's, it's a, a vampire. 
that wants to take your spirit. It's going to take it, transport it, take it out of your, your, your bodies. Uh, you know, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. It's, it's, we know even on a nutritional level that a refined sugar is, is nutrient depleting. It lowers our levels of chromium and B vitamins and other minerals and n nutrition generally. Should we use ceramic knives instead of metal knives? Ceramic makes much more sense, and ceramics have a huge range of properties. So ceramics have the, the, the capacity to be designed to even have health-promoting effects. You could have a ceramic, for example, that contains different minerals. It's like a clay. Ceramic is like clay. Now, clay can have a huge, wide range of properties depending on what's in it. So it can be designed to have, say, a negative electrical charge, so that instead of removing electrons from a food when you cut it, it could add electrons to it. That would be wonderful. You know, we want to design, redesign, retool our technological world to where we're feeding the spirit and the mind, not as is being done now, weaponizing the, the tools and foods so that we keep uh, keep people unconscious, keep them unhealthy, keep them weak, weakened so they can be in mental slavery. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm wanting to be able to kind of grasp the clinical theory of everything. And yep. I'm feeling like I'm not getting it. Yeah, the the, the real problem. Is that okay? the, yeah, it is. It's okay. it's it's. I just per, want to check. It's in. perfect. Okay. If you feel like you're missing something, it's because you are, because it's so big that you can't possibly you know I, I, we can't possibly sit here and go through it. Here, imagine it's a beach ball. Okay. Here's the theory. It's a beach ball. We're gonna go through the theory. <laughs> okay, we just went through it from point A to point B, and we hit a couple things in the middle. But, but still you're wondering, well, but, you know, I, I don't even understand why it has these colors on it or what's inside it. We talked about point A and point B, what's in between. So it's why I'm doing this to begin for myself to see how can I chunk it down? How can I relate it? How, what works to get the model, which is in here? Like when Einstein came up with relativity, it was like eight years before he could tell anyone anything about it because it was an image in his head. He could see it, but he had to figure out, how do I put this in equations? How do I describe this in mathematical terms? Okay, so, but let me try. I'm gonna go back for a second to, to uh, the, the, the uh, relationship of the cell membrane, because we were talking about the senses, like the eyes, the ner whole nervous system is a specialized function of the skin. Embryologically, it starts as skin tissue, and then it develops into the neural tube, and and goes inside the body and becomes the nervous system. And the endocrine system is part of that process and the autonomic nervous system. And it all comes from the skin originally. So the skin is like the cell membrane for this level of cell, organismic level of the cell. At, at a, a cultural level, we have, you know, a nation could be like a cell. We can look at it, oh, it has borders, yes. How are the board, what's the border function like? Is there consciousness at the borders, you know? Are the borders, there's two states, anabolic, catabolic. Is it in an anabolic state where the borders are saying, oh yeah, great, these are resources we can use, come on in, you know, we're doing business, we're open for business, come on in, bring, you know, bring your wares, come, you know, get what you need from us and we can communicate. Or are we shut down? Are we in fear? Are we saying, uh-uh, there's, I'm, I'm under threat, I'm under duress, there's stress happening, so I'm in a detoxification mode. I'm in, my immune system's activated to take out invaders, I'm, you know, which mode are we in? That's an important question. The, the question on an organismic level is about self. Who am I and what is not self? Because topologically there might be not self inside. Oh, that hurts. That doesn't feel like me. That feels like something getting me. Right? How, how do we identify? Or, I see you as another self. I, I treat you as I would like to be treated myself. Myself can be as big as the stars. Or as small as only a very small portion of me. Or gone altogether. I may check out another spirit entity may come in and operate the biology 
And on a spiritual level, that's acknowledged to be true, you know, widely true, that there's many who function not as their, their own soul, but the, you know, operating in commerce as if they were a real, live, sentient being. But there are, there are programs that don't have life in them. You know, we can call these fallen angels. Well, they, they only have life if we give them that. We, what we need to activate our planetary cellular level is to identify everyone, every human being as self. You know, you're another self for me. Now, you may be in a state of, of viability or non-viability. You may be in a state that I'm safe interacting with or that I need to keep my distance. But we know now that even if you're at a distance where you can't even see me, I can see you in my mind's eye. I can affect you. And my thoughts, my vision, my intention does have a real effect on you. So treat our thoughts as things. Be responsible for the world that each of us is actually creating every moment. And, and we can affect the future and we can affect the past. We're navigating in space-time. Again, this is where the spiritual world, the spiritual truth is, is beyond the relativity of Einstein because we can affect the future and the past. We're not limited by you know, billiard balls going through a mechanical dead universe and, and that, you know, life is a random, you know, a random meeting of, of those billiard balls. It's, it's so far beyond that. We are part of a living conscious universe. We are cells in that divine body as much as this, a cell in your immune system is part of your body.